Michelle. Um, so next we have Charlotte Brickler and Dominic Amos on their talk, a live crop, a networked approach to variety testing on farm that delivers real world results. I'll give you, thank you very much. I, I'll give you two minute notes. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. <laughs> um, so Dominic and I are just going to have a bit of a chat through the work that we've been doing for a number of years now, um, working with farmers to test varieties on farm and understand which varieties work best in organic and low input systems. So I work at the Organic Research Centre as a researcher in crop diversification. And I also support UK Grain Lab in its work facilitating the transition to a more diverse, democratic and decentralised grain system. And Dominic is joining from Cope Seeds and Grapes, where he's recently moved from Organic Arable. And Dominic and I worked together at the Organic Research Centre and established this work in 2017. So to kick things off, Dominic, could you tell us a bit about the work, the trial work that you've been involved with historically? And what led us to this? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here and share this experience and yeah, knowledge that we've gained over the last seven or eight years with you. Um, so I cut my teeth in terms of participatory research on the Innovative Farmers Program. Um, and that was a really steep learning curve. I think, um, and it was, you know, it's putting a researcher outside of their comfort zone, I would say. I mean, some... Um, do try and get on farm. I just, I feel with agriculture, it's such an applied practical thing that, you know, classical research separated from the place where that practice needs to be implemented to make that impact and that, um, have that, yeah, that real world effect. Um, it needs to be connected much better. So I think in understanding that you're trying to almost compromise between the robustness of data and the relevance of it that you don't i don't think you can always understand the relevance without working directly with the farmer and understanding their needs understanding what works and understanding the specific con um context so as an example the first uh the first innovative farmers field lab i worked on was about um compost teas now i didn't have the first clue about compost tea um, but I do also firmly believe like research is a process and as long as you understand the process and the methodology you can apply it to anything I don't think you need to necessarily be an expert in a particular field I actually think it might even be a benefit because you can be quite narrow not narrow-minded wrong word um kind of focus uh and very 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 specialized in a particular area so you don't see the bigger picture and actually in response to one your question, Julian, which was controversial, no, no, about um, do you need researchers? Yeah, so I think the best researchers, well, sorry, again, so yeah, very specialists, but you also have generalists, and the generalists need the specialists, and vice versa. So sometimes it's about connecting dots and pulling it all together, and if you're very specialised, you can't always do that. So I think being a generalist is also really powerful, and I think that can be one of the main things that a research can can bring to participatory research um, is connecting those dots. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah. So, well, <laughs> to give a bit wider context, we've kind of had a bit of a tension there at ORC in our developing this, this work that we're talking about today. And we started out with plot trials, didn't we, Dominic? And, and thinking about how we could engage farmers in those plot trials. And this is what this, this image here represents because we've got the, the pegs of uh, votes on on which plot looks the best, but we came across a number of challenges when we were when we were implementing that work and trying to really make it relevant to the farm system. Um, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so in fact, yeah, one of the things that we should have touched on in the last question was that we we were at the start of this, just before this, maybe a year or two before, we were involved in a couple of European projects. Um, and we were running plot trials at the University of Sonning. Well, sorry, University of Reading, but their Sonning site. 
um, the farm there. Now it's kind of in the Thames floodplain. The, the land's very light. We're obviously running it um, in terms of the kind of organic husbandry. But very quickly, we realized that the trial site wasn't representative of an organic, of a commercial organic farm. Um, the results we were getting were being, I would argue, negatively impacted by a completely random soil type that no organic farm was farming on, or at least the farmers we were working with. Very weird um, uh, weed community that we wouldn't expect to see in an arable rotation. And it was kind of one of those sites where it was a there was no no agrochemicals being added, but that didn't make it organic. It's not a system. Um, and I think, yeah, very quickly we realized if we wanted to find, you know, answers to the to the questions that the farmers had around, well, there's no breeding for organic, and we don't think, you know, the recommended list only tells us so much, and it's maybe not not as useful um, as it could be for us. That actually, yeah, we needed to take that research out onto farm. Now I don't, I don't knock a plot trial approach because I think there's a hybrid there. You can do stuff in plot trials that you can't do on farm. The farm trials need to be quite simplistic. I think what we had here was really interesting. So the farmers were coming out, they had all the varieties in one place, which again, we don't, we don't do on farm because it would be too many strips and too complicated for them to do. Um, so they could, they could assess and rank and look at traits next to each other. Obviously, that's the most robust comparison is the varieties all in one place managed completely the same. Um, so we had them voting and selecting, and that was kind of a part of the pipeline towards what we would then test on farm. Okay. So, yeah, we, we've kind of learned that there's a, there's a bit of a balance between the theory and the technical experimental design and then the the real experience on farm and a, com a combination of that would deliver the best results. So maybe you could talk a bit about what the initial concept behind this live wheat project of strip trials on farms was and uh, where that took us to. Yeah, so again, I really started to touch on that. So organic farmers, again, back in 2015, 2016, we would go to lots of conferences and hear a lot from organic arable farmers about um, some of the issues and we've had a project, a European project, um, which was, uh, yeah, about knowledge exchange. And we had to interview a group of farmers in this country about what their key production challenges were. Um, and some of it might be quite obvious, you know, we don't have enough nitrogen in the system or we've got weeds to deal with. And, and one of the top things was we just don't think we've got the right varieties. Um, now, if you took that back to its logical conclusion, you'd say, well, well, there needs to be breeding for organic, but that's years in the making. And we just don't have the system and the, the um, again, the real world um, facts are that the seed market, the organic seed market just isn't big enough to make that economically sustainable. So, so we have to deal with the situation at hand, the world as it is, rather than how we wanted it to be. Um, and so we decided that just screening what was out there was already a really important part of finding out what worked and what didn't work. So we used what was available to us. We obviously have quite limited resources as well, but we understood from the experience at Sonning um, at that research farm that, yeah, to investigate how things perform under organic husbandry, it needed to be out on organic farms. Um, and you have to think that, you know, ecology and regeneration, that takes time. So actually... Yeah, those weed communities and the microbial communities that you have within the soil, the soil health, that's taken time. That's part of an organic system. And it's not the case that you can just take a trial site with raw chemicals and say, well, this is what we'd expect on an organic farm. Also, their management, the farmer's management is hugely important. It has an impact. Well, we'll talk about that a bit later because that's beyond just the genetics and the varieties, the extra things that you can learn from, again, doing it out on farm in the real world. Yeah, so I I think it was bringing together the research out, looking at plots and trying to draw in the farmers to that, to then thinking how we could collectively gather data on farm and using these larger scale, farm scale harvestable strips. So the, the crops managed by the farmer and they, they, they harvest and, and collect the data on harvest themselves and do all the management. Um, and, and the contribution is that the, the seed is, is paid for and we design a, a complementary network, so collectively the data comes together to give us robust data about the differences in varieties across these different farms. So 
Do you think that that has had a positive impact on it? Definitely. So this is a collection of all the um, yield data across the last seven years. Um, and you can see, I mean, the, the actual variety names and what have you doesn't, doesn't matter that much. But what you can see is a, a gradual progression in the yields from the variety selections each season. So we're building on it as iterative, which varieties don't seem to work. The beauty of this as well, lots of organic farm would say, well, it's not just about yield and hasn't part of the problem with industrial agriculture being, oh, this huge drive for yield at the expense of everything else. But it is about yield, as long as farmers are paid on, you know, tons of grain. Um, but also it was about lots of other traits, especially for organic farming, where you need weed suppression, that's really important. Again, it's part of a system within the season. Um, so we weren't just identifying the, the top yielding ones, but also what other agroecological uh, contributions they were making to the system and to the, to the field. So, I mean, you saw the previous slide where you had the poppies in the farm um, and those strips. So we identified a couple of years ago, this variety Mayflower, now it's a subtle difference. So there's a blend of it with X days in the middle and then you've got X days on the right. Now X days was like a benchmark variety in organic farming because of its early vigor. And it's been one of the top yielding. Last year it wasn't. But, um, and we have theories about that around the fact that it's quite an early variety. So when we come back to climate resilience, being early has been a benefit to that variety because it's vigorous early, it helps suppress weeds. But last season, because obviously organic farming is relying on biological release of nutrients and the soils are in such a terrible you know, condition, wet and cold, a long way into the spring, actually being an early variety was a real disadvantage. And last year we found later varieties were an advantage, but if you flip that, you get a drought season, the early varieties advantaged and the late varieties disadvantaged, which is part of the reason we came up with an idea of blending those two. So then you've got a climate resilience as well built in that you might not be able to breed into a single variety. Um, and that's part of, again, the progression we've made. So not just varieties, but blends. And you can see two or three examples on there of blends that are outperforming the average of the two. So we're you know, really starting to prove that. And I know, again, I've included these letters because it's like classical research. Let's do a two-key test on it and let's see on the estimated marginal means. Um, and you could say, well, actually, there's not a lot of statistically significant difference in there. Um, and if you're writing that in a paper, then, yeah, you wouldn't be able to make these bold claims. But having said that, out in the real world with the resolution that we have, and again, the relevance of it, I don't need a letter or a p-value to tell me that Mayflower suppresses weeds and it's a good variety for organic farming. Um, or that astronomers has been very consistent over the last three years and it performs well, even though... Um, so if you got down to Crispin, it would have you believe that it's not statistically any better than Maris Widgen. Um, you know, applying common sense as well to research uh, really helps make a difference, I think, out in the real world. Yeah, so we find that when you go out with a relatively broad question about what varieties perform well on organic farms, you open up a whole treasure box of insight and experience. Um, and I guess we kind of differ a bit in opinion in how we should interpret the data sometimes and, and what those statistics mean. Um, I do think that you have to think about the robustness of the data. And that's obviously a challenge that we face when trying to uh, broaden the application of this approach um, in that can it deliver statistically relevant data that is, is going to be able to advise and re provide recommendations for a, a wider group of farmers. So. I think we want to explore that by broadening the network, testing across a greater range of, it, of environments. And the key is getting more farms involved, isn't it, really, Dominic? Um, moving a bit off, off topic there. but um, So it, it, it is so important to think of it in the, in the wider context. And even though we might find a really, uh, what looks like a top performing from a statistical and a kind of, observational point of view uh, variety that there's so much that that, that scuppers or uh, leads to a variety going forward and, and we've experienced that as well haven't we yeah and that's also been really frustrating um but again you're doing research in the real world you're exposing yourself to economic realities commercial realities supply chain reality and the factors we identified 
really good varieties for organic farming that were no longer available commercially for whatever reason, usually, well, usually because it hadn't captured, captured the imagination, it wasn't performing very well conventionally. So organic farming has to rely necessarily on seed that's being produced, um, sorry, varieties that are bred for conventional farming. Um, and then the seed system as well, uh, because again, it's just not commercially viable to produce seed only for the organic sector. Um, so that's definitely been a frustration that it's not only actually doing this work to find them. When you do, you could lose a variety very quickly. Um, it's difficult to maintain them if they're not, you know, in the wider system. Um, also with Brexit, like we found varieties from France and Sweden that look really good, but just the, the logistics of getting seed over here at a commercial level um, once we left the European Union was an absolute nightmare. Um, yeah, so, so there's a couple of things there. I would say also even in doing the trials, we started, there are a couple of things I think that developed. One was the design. We had a very specific design to start with a balanced incomplete block. So it was like this very, um, it lacked resilience actually, the design, because if, if one trial failed, you'd sort of lost this robustness from it. Um, so even that we simplified and just made sure we had a control variety across the farms, which really helps then make the design more resilient. And especially, in, I think we had a season three or four years ago, it was so wet, only half the farmers drilled. Now, if we'd had a had a very specific design that relied on everybody doing it, then we'd have been, you know, we'd have been scuppered. So that was that was another learning from, I think, doing it out in the, on farm, because if you had your standard pot trials, you'd have all your replication and, and um, yeah, you'd be more resilient, I think, again, years. And the other thing was sending the farmers the right varieties. So again, they, they, they've got a market, they've got to market their grain, they've got sure. end markets that they're growing for and quality they need to hit. And we needed to understand the context of their farms and actually what made sense. Again, you could identify a load of varieties, but you wouldn't necessarily know what was working in what context. And that, again, wasn't just about agronomy, but also about their own markets. Yeah, so in the early days, we, we had this joke of us being the the corn exchange in our little office going ringing the farmers and asking them to grow certain varieties to fit in with our design but then obviously through that iterative process of learning together over time we we, we modified the design yeah so we had more flexibility and i and i remember things like sending a organically bred variety from austria to a farm in on the bend in lincolnshire with grade one agricultural land that yields 10 ton a hectare from a feed we and you know these things just didn't make any sense so we slowly learned it all conversely farmers who were growing for a milling market never hitting spec growing the wrong varieties and actually realizing that you know they could grow a feed variety and that was much better for their income than trying to hit um milling spec and actually just to touch on the photo that we have here so here's an example of a variety we found that was really weed suppressive it is really weed suppressive um the reason for that is because it covers the ground really effectively but i think what's really interesting about this is that the breeder was unaware of that because you would never test it in the in the conventional system you would never test it with a weed community it never has a weed community so you know i'd argue that's a really interesting result that we found again from putting this stuff out on farms in the real world with a weed community and you know everything else that the farmers have to cope with however this is a variety that i don't think is performing that well conventionally obviously if you have herbicides you need to rely less on weed suppression i would argue last season in particular shows you that having a weed suppressive variety as a backstop is really important because i think a lot of farmers either their herbicides were washed out of the ground or they couldn't get on to apply them so I think this kind of stuff should be more and more relevant to a non-organic farming community. Um, and then another commercial reality is, is, you know, you're in a conveyor belt of varieties and breeders bring out new varieties and they lose interest from a marketing perspective in older varieties or for whatever. Um, uh, stable in their horse. Stable in their horse. Horse in their stable. <laughs> Um, and this one, this one, they're not, they're not that interested in. So we'll probably drop away. And actually, it has fantastic traits for organic farming. In seven years, never seen anything like it in terms of being able to suppress weeds purely from purely from early ground cover. And that's also, again, something we've learned not just about variety. What are the traits you need? Early ground cover over winter, late winter, early spring, hugely important for weed suppression. 
So, I mean, in terms of the evidence that was available about what is needed from organic breeding or breeding for organic, we know about these traits that it's there. It's been studied for years in pot trials, but taking it out on farms, we really managed to bring it to life. And you were talking about the experience of, of taking the seed company out to see this, this field and then them realizing, oh, we, we, we're, we're kind of betting on the wrong horse here because they, it had never been explored in that context. So working with the network of farmers and with the researchers being uh, adding in the, the, the di design and the technicality to it, um, but then go on and, and influence the, the wider industry in a way that the research going off on its own and, and telling everyone we know that these traits are important for organic breeding, but it never happens. Um, and, and we've seen that now organic weak acreage, whether we can whether we can claim it ourselves, it, it has improved. When we were, this is why we chose wheat to begin with, because when we started in 2017, it was going down and it was often cited that that the varieties just weren't there being the, the reason for that for organics. Do you have any comment on yeah what where it is now in terms of the wider context and yeah, absolutely. So yes, slightly anecdotally, but when we arrived, when we started on this journey, the wheat, the organic wheat acreage was dropping. Winter wheat was perceived as a really difficult crop, crop to grow organically, or um, because you know it wasn't wheat suppressive and it was a hungry crop. You know, if you compared it to oats, people often describe oats as not particularly hungry, so it doesn't need as much nutrition, it, and it's very weed suppressive. So you know, winter oats work great organically. Um, but wheat was a challenge. And I think, yeah, for sure, the acreage has gone back up. I know from the company that I was working for, uh, involved in seed sales, that our seed sales of organic wheat had trebled over the course of three or four years, um, purely because we could give farmers the right advice. We had confidence in saying, you should grow this, and this is how you grow it. These are the right varieties. And we overcame a lot of those agronomic challenges, again, as a result of this work. And so working with the network more broadly has also given us an insight into other crop management recommendations and, and, and what an organic farming system looks like. And uh, it, it led to other insights which we hadn't expected. Maybe you could say a bit about that. Yeah, so um, to a degree, you know, we started at a position where we were kind of flying blind, as it were, as researchers, so were the farmers, so was the industry. Um, so actually, yeah, understanding that varieties played an important um, part in the production, and I don't want to overstate it, but it's still very important. The difference between the right variety or the most suitable variety and the wrong variety can be quite large, um, particularly when you talk about organic farming. And... We also started to learn more about how the farmers manage the crop and the impact that would have. So then it's not just about straight genetics, but the environmental impact and interactions, the management impact in particular. Um, so we were able to uh, uh, add a context, a management context uh, into the system and the analysis, which was about whether an organic farmer manages their crop within row hoeing and they have the crop on a wide row, or if they have that on a narrow row and their springtime harrowing. And we started to learn more about what effect that has on the wheat community. Um, so the, essentially, the more intensive your weed management, the more aggressive your weed community ends up. And we were finding on the wide row farms that they're really pushing towards quite aggressive grass weed communities, so black grass and wild oats, whereas your less intensive weed management, um, so the narrow rows, you rely more on crop competition. The springtime harrowing, you had a much more benign weed community. So things like speedwell growing over the wind, <laughs> almost forming a living mulch, but a natural living mulch, suppressing the more aggressive weeds. So yeah, so a, a diverse weed community is almost self-controlling. Um, and I would say at the other end of the scale, obviously the most intensive way to manage weeds is herbicides. And obviously you get one or two really nasty, pernicious weeds. So these sorts of additional learnings as well, I think are yeah. really important. We gained a lot of insight into all these other factors and we felt, you know, chatting in preparation for day today that, you know, having that open and broad approach at the beginning led to other important results that were relevant to the farming network that we're working with, but also the organic community more broadly. Um, 
and yeah, not going in with a very strict hypothesis, yeah, is 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 key to that. So yeah, because I would argue, you know, in very classical research, and I'm not knocking it, absolutely has its place. Um, and we've built on that with this. Yeah, you often go into even a PhD, very narrow focus, very specific hypothesis. We actually just started with, you know, can we can we do this? Does it work? Is it relevant? And what can we find out? Um, and it's amazing what we have found out. Yeah, we've got a lot of other hypotheses that we could look at now and that appreciation of the whole wider context, you know, the social factors as well as the agronomic. Can I have one final question just to wrap it up in where 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 do we go now? Where are things going next? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, again, unfortunately, the reality is that it does cost money to run this stuff that I think ha <laughs> um, <laughs> to connect dots and to bring it all together and to do the analysis. You know, I'm not expecting farmers to sit down with complex, you know, mixed effects models and figure that all out. Um, someone to coordinate it and bring that all together is really important. And the work needs to continue because, it, as I say, it's a tread, you know, it's a treadmill, it's a cycle um, to continue to identify the right varieties. So in, in terms of funding, I don't know, is this something, someone like the AHDB could support with their levy as a as a kind of let's say addition um to the recommended list maybe i think it addresses a lot of what they had in their review around um something closer to farm practice something um research with lower inputs uh and something that's quite cost effective because we do this at a fraction of the price of you know what it would cost to run a network of plot trials all around the country I think we'll leave it there. More questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Yeah, really fantastic conversation. And I already have loads of things to discuss. So I can imagine that we're going to have an exciting discussion session. So our last speaker is...